3x minus 7 equals 15 has turned into a bit of a longer anatomical lesson than I imagined when I started this. But even though we've gotten a lot out of the three questions we started with, the questions about where x comes from, when do we start using equations, we're really still just scratching the surface, even when it comes to which letters get picked as symbols. I'd like to finish this episode by mentioning some of the differences between how math and physics today choose letters as symbols. Ideally, the link between a symbol and its meaning is arbitrary. The three that we write up on the board isn't three itself, it's just a symbol that we've chosen, a numeral, to represent three. This will matter more when we do things like look deeply into counting itself, or when we look at other number systems that have been used and developed through history. But just because the link between a symbol and its meaning can be arbitrary, doesn't mean that in practice it is. There are differences between how different groups assign symbols in their work. The kind of things that insiders will pick up implicitly, but which outsiders might not even notice. Physics and math, for instance, have different personalities and different ways that math fits into their work. And by looking at something like how symbols tend to get handed out, we can get some clues about their sociological and philosophical differences. When it comes to symbol names, we already know that math has its favorites. X is the most loved of all. Mathematicians are really predictable this way. They'll use X, Y, and Z first, and for variables or unknowns, but then they'll start at the beginning of the alphabet using things like A, B, and C for constants or coefficients. There's also contexts where maybe mathematicians will typically use certain Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, or different kinds of Greek letters, things like theta or zeta. These are very common patterns. Yet, at the same time, the connection between the symbol and the thing it represents is totally just convention. If someone breaks it, no big deal. Like, yeah, P can be prime, but so can L, sure. I knew a set theorist, even, who would print tiny Bucky Badger icons as variables. In physics, though, the symbols much more frequently are very tightly attached to meaning. H bar, wherever you happen to see it, is Planck's constant. No one is allowed to use that letter for anything else. A lowercase t had better mean time, but you can use an uppercase t for temperature. And theta better be an angle. These kinds of assignments reflect an intent in physics to map the objective world using math. In math, you might be making up totally new worlds, but in physics, it's all about referencing this one particular actual world. One funny thing, at least if you don't need to rely on getting right answers for something mission critical, is that math and physics don't even use the same symbols when they agree on what they're being used for. Probably the best example that I can think of is three-dimensional space. When using Cartesian coordinates, x, y, and z are the three directions of the three dimensions of space in both math and physics, but which letter represents which direction changes between the two fields. This is because in math, the order of letters coincides with how hard it is to draw those directions on a piece of paper. First, you've got x. That's horizontal, like a number line. Another invention we should look into at some point. Then y is assigned the vertical. And then z, after you've already got that plane up on the wall, has to come straight out of the page or out of the board. In physics, this works out differently. The order also follows complexity, but here complexity comes about through thinking about physical systems. X and Y together constitute a horizontal plane, and Z is always up. So if you're keeping track in math, this direction, this direction here, that's y. But in physics, that direction is z. So this same distinction also holds when you're using spherical coordinates. Their three dimensions are given by a radius and then two perpendicular angles, theta and phi. But then which angle represents which letter changes between math and physics. Just a word of caution if you're ever trying to do any three-dimensional calculus to double check which one you're using at which time. This also might be our first example and indication that the math we do is not an objective feature of the universe. It's a human artifact. It's not distilled logic. I think the most useful analogy to think about math with is to compare it to technology. If you know, for example, the, the story about the QWERTY keyboard layout that we use here in the US, you'll be at least a little familiar with the thesis that technology doesn't always march straight towards progress, and that progress in one arena might be considered retrograde in another. 
We don't need to go far into it now, but technologies and math don't develop and find uses as you might expect if you could plan them from the beginning. Progress itself can be a pretty messy notion to think about, and its definition depends not just on when and where, but also who's involved, what their purpose is. This confusion or variable names, or even just the differences in mathematical style, turn out to be just the tip of the iceberg. And in closing, before we leave this episode entirely, I want to give a little bit of a, a message about what happens after 1750. If you recall, a couple sections ago, we said by the time you get to Euler, in 1750, things start to look about how you might expect. So I, I had set up this anatomy lesson to shed some light on where 3x minus 7 equals 15 comes from. And by 1750, we've got an essentially modern system of notation. If we go further back, our particular problem written differently would have made sense already and been doable by mathematically literate people for a long time in many societies. We've left some of those details for later, but what we haven't yet said anything about is what happened after 1750. So from looking at school algebra, we might get the sense that algebra hasn't changed at all since then. This is both exactly right and totally wrong, but that's gonna need to wait for another day. I just wanted to mention it now to remind you that we won't just be doing history here. And even when we're doing history, a lot happens after 1750. As we continue, I'll have some suggestions of possible projects to continue with. One way to start is with some of the specific questions that we had. Question one was when and where did people start using letters and symbols when doing math? Question two was why do we use X as our first choice for a symbol in math? Question three was when do we start thinking about solving problems in terms of winning the equations game? In other words, solving for x. So we can think about what are other ways to make our questions about symbols and equations more specific? What kinds of equations come up along the way? Very especially, what were the actual, like, real-life historical contexts that some of the people whose work we talked about lived in? And what else in the world was this development in mathematics connected to? With that, I'll sign off. Until next time, this has been Anatomy of Algebra, and I'm Chris Holden.